Hello, uh, welcome everyone to the closing of the second day of the Jobs Reset Summit here at the World Economic Forum. I am delighted to be able to bring in a panel uh, of um, long-term uh, contributors and collaborators with the forum, um, as well as new voices that we hope will be driving forward action on today's theme, which is work, wages, and job creation. Uh, I am delighted to announce the panelists, uh, and, then, and then we'll uh, bring in uh, Shobana as well. Uh, so we have with us today Alan Blue, co-founder and vice president um, of products at LinkedIn. Welcome, Alan. We have Stephen Cotton, general secretary, International Transport Workers Federation in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, Tamar Kityashvili, um, Deputy Minister, Minister, Ministry of Education, Science, Culture, and Sport of Georgia. Uh, Geraldine Machet, Co-Chief Executive Officer and Chief Financial Officer of Royal DSM. Welcome, Geraldine, and also a co-chair of this summit. Um, and finally, Lena Nair, a Chief Human Resources Officer at Unilever. Welcome, Lena. Delighted to have you here as well. Um, and I believe we are now joined by Shobana, Shobana Kamineni, um, Executive Vice Chairperson, Apollo Hospitals Enterprise in India. Welcome, Shobana. Great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, my apologies. Uh, we, I had some technical difficulty. Anyway, the mobile phone always comes in handy. Uh, am I audible? Um, I've Hello? already introduced the panel. Okay, that's perfect. So, so let me just get into it. And I think uh, it's important for us to understand uh, today's session is focused on how we can reset jobs, wages and work for the new economy and society. I know it's, uh, all, it's always a tough challenge, much tougher now, uh, considering this world we live in. Uh, I was just you know, looking at a study that said out of the 1.6 billion um, unorganized jobs in the world, almost 50% are at risk. China, one of the only countries which will register a positive growth GDP, there are 140 million jobs lost. 10% of the world is hospitality industry and uh, we know that it's decimated and there are a lot of women and youth which are, you know, out of jobs. So in this future, in this, uh, in this uh, pandemic future and in the struggles that we live with, I think that this is a very timely uh, you know, discussion. And we highlighted new insights on trends related to jobs, wages, and work, and surfaced new standards and examples of best practice around the world in the future of work and the health at work and the potential new solutions and approaches for job creation, valuing frontline work and workers and social protection. As we close this day, we would love to hear reflections and next steps from our coaches and other participants in the Jobs Reset Summit. So I'm going to get right into it and uh, I welcome our distinguished panelists and I welcome all those that do, who have logged in from around the world and are listening. So my first question would be actually very quickly to the three uh, panelists, uh, Alan Blue, Geraldine uh, Matchett and Stephen Cotton, respectively. What do you think are the highest priorities on the jobs, wages and work agenda? And how would you be taking action on all those? May I request Alan Blue to go first? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, I wanted to highlight just a couple of things. Um, the first is that in the work we've done with the WEF in the last uh, several years on the Future of Jobs report, we have uh, discovered over and over again how important uh, the role of technology is in the future of work. Almost every emerging role we see is one which is either a technology role or which is a technology enabled role. So it could be an engineer or a data scientist, or it could be someone who's working in uh, 
marketing or sales or customer service, but doing so in a way which is in, enabled by tech. Um, that means that a lot of skill and effort on making sure people are technically literate is essential and technically capable of taking these jobs. Uh, there is good news though. The first is that uh, we believe the economy right now could absorb even 150 million new tech workers and do so easily over the next five years. So that means there's loads of opportunity to get hired in the world of technology right now. And as someone who works in the world of technology, I can tell you that hiring technology people is a constant challenge because there's so much uh, competition for the roles, even now during the pandemic. Um, the second thing is that many of the emerging roles in the world of technology are actually surprisingly accessible. So in our uh, world, uh, uh, work with the forum, this time on the uh, Future of Jobs report. There's information about the career transitions into these cutting edge jobs. And when you look at things like artificial intelligence and data scientists, um, very frequently 71% of the people who take those jobs come from backgrounds which are quite different than the ones uh, uh, for the jobs they're entering. So there's lots of opportunity, not just for tech roles, but lots of opportunity for people to take these cutting edge roles as these new jobs are being defined. Thank you. I can ask you many more questions, but uh, I'm going to pass the same question on priorities in jobs, wages, and work agenda to uh, uh, to actually Geraldine Matchett uh, from Royal DSN. Hello, Shabana, and um, I just want to start first by saying as co-chair um, that it's incredible the amount of energy and the dialogue and the quality of the conversations that have been going on today. And it just shows how, you know, as the World Economic Forum uh, really wanted to dedicate time on this, how valuable it is to hear all the different voices. Now, <clears throat> in terms of focus areas, um, there's, of course, the whole reskilling, the transition, etc. But if we think about the social contract, um, really, that is underpinning all of this, uh, one thing that for me has been coming out is the fact that we need to really also rethink the work, the definition of work, the definition of a workplace, and the fact that, um, as we've seen over time, there's been an increasing separation between work and the rest of our lives. And what I mean by that is that you have a society where either you are in employment, but that is pretty much all that you do, or you are out. You're in or you're out. You fit or you don't fit. Now, the priorities that really, uh, beyond all of the reskilling and education, I think the priorities, particularly for the private sector, is to change the mindset and start to have a different approach to take to being more people-centric and less... Um, maybe engineering-like in the way of considering work and the relationship with people. And what I would mean by that is in three points. First, I think at least private enterprise, but probably most enterprises should become more accommodating. And by the way, I think technology is gonna help in terms of part-time work, in terms, and not in a negative sense, because there's always been a little bit, of, mm, this is a downgrade. No, it's not a downgrade, it's more flexible. Working from different places, mobility, access to work for people who before would not have had access to those jobs in a quality way. And today's debate actually highlighted that this needs to be done while protecting the quality of employment. So this is not about degrading or making more precarious. It's actually about giving more shapes and forms to the kind of work that we can engage. And the COVID crisis has shown us that actually it's very possible to change the definition and the format of work. The other thing is clearly about the, the definition in terms of what is it that we are doing when we work from task to skills. And I was glad to hear you, Alan, uh, really highlight the fact that transitioning people to different activities in their careers should be a lot less binary of have you done it, yes or no, but effectively, do you have the skills to learn it and realize that it's a journey and companies should be a lot more engaging and building trust that those journeys are done together. Uh, and last but not least for me is trust. Um, and that is uh, trust across the public sector, the private sector, 
and society that we're going to work together in building something which is much more resilient in terms of long-term employability um, because there is indeed too much precariousness and that is employability not only physically but also in terms of mental health um, and, and effectively also making work purposeful. So these are some of the trends but I have to say it's been such a rich day that it's difficult to summarize. True, true. Uh, I'm going to pass this question on to, uh, to uh, Stephen Cotton and get his response before we move into uh, the next question that I'm just waiting to ask you all. Thanks, Savannah, and thanks everyone for the opportunity um, for, for addressing you today. For us, I think, in the labour movement, many of the things we just heard are really positive because um, our, our view is it all has to be about jobs. But what do jobs mean? I kind of echo some of Geraldine's points that at the moment we have the reaction to, to the pandemic and the concerns are about secure jobs, good quality jobs and good skills. So for us in the labour movement, I obviously represent transport, but all of the, the workers of the world are very anxious. And what is responsibility for us as those mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. is, is to look at how do we reassure workers that the future of work technology isn't a threat. And both of the pre previous speakers have identified those key issues. But for us, there's also the question of dealing with the inequality. And we see the numbers from the ILO about the impact on women and young workers. Now there's opportunities in that as well. And I think for us in the labor movement, we do want to attack the model of precarious work because that doesn't help foster um, belief in skills. And you know, Geraldine, the word trust, is utterly critical for the labor movement. And I think our constant position is, how do we take a seat at the table that represent the concerns of working people, men, women, young workers, and then reassure them with the corporate companies, the multinationals, even the small companies today that are threatened to the edge of existence, that this doesn't mean you're gonna go. And then there's a number of questions that we could come on about, about partnership with governments, and opportunities. So for us in, in, the, in the labor movement, we're open to the debate, but there has to be that confidence that reskilling the investment in people to create opportunities, opportunities that will ensure that it's a long-term life of work. Of course, we recognize now that technology is gonna change the culture of work and what tasks we do today will change over time and, and it's good that technology can help us but if technology is seen as a threat then, and we start in a conflict then we won't be able to, to deal with the issue and I think just for us um, we've seen in reaction to the pandemic that all jobs whether you're dealing with cleaners who have become more and more critical and who would have imagined that 12 months ago in the sense of course they need to be protected from um, precarious work but they've become more and more critical. And then there's the health and safety element. So for us in the labor movement, there's a lot of opportunities to drill down into creating uh, better jobs, secure jobs, decent jobs that will give the opportunity for young men, young women to have good skills and build a lifetime of work that will see them contribute to society. Thank you. And I like a lot of those thoughts when you're talking about good quality jobs and sustaining them uh, through their life. And I do think that uh, the demographics today are changing so much in terms of, you know, people living longer and, uh, and so many of them getting into the workforce in different ways, whether it's apprentice or gig workers or, you know, they're, they're, they're extremely fluid, work from home. And, and so I would ask, um, I, I would actually ask mm -hmm. Jeremy and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Aaron, how would you deploy, uh, you know, how would businesses, how, what's the best way to deploy their efforts in this situation? So uh, can I ask Geraldine first? And, and Geraldine, um, you know, you're, you're one of the only women on the panel until Lena comes on. And so talk about women during this pandemic also. I mean, I'm, I'm here in a country that, Actually, so many women's jobs have are at risk. So, where would you, where would businesses deploy their effort? 
Yeah, thanks, Shavana. And, and, and just to make sure we don't have a process issue, Tamara and, um, um, sorry, uh, Lena are online now. Huh? So um, just so that, you know, um, but from our part, what we're looking at is uh, clearly that inclusion and diversity is something that we want to be working very hard on. And we are part of the World Economic Forward uh, hardwiring gender parity. And, and I have to say that is a big partnership on education and on creating flexibility. And I think this is what has been added to the equation since say 12 months ago. Uh, we have a lot of women in our company, for example, that are in the STEM business. So it's all about science. Um, so mathematicians, engineers, chemists. Uh, and, and here, typically you would wanna be able to not only attract, retain, but also give more flexibility. Uh, but here it's, it's maybe not the front end uh, workers that you are thinking about. So maybe I will hand over to one of my co-panelists who uh, may want to say more about that. Yeah, Alan, uh, love to hear your thoughts. Oh, well, so just briefly, because I do want to make sure that uh, that that uh, Lena and Tamar uh, are able to contribute. Um, one of the things regarding companies is to um, to encourage companies to invest in working with uh, the people around them who can help build pipelines of talent into their companies. Um, we know that when you're trying to hire hard to find employees, companies are willing to do extraordinary things to bring new people in. Um, it's an opportunity for us, for companies to work with uh, training programs, with apprenticeships, with labor, in order to be able to train uh, workers to come in and take those jobs. Um, uh, there are great partnerships to be built. Uh, and this is something we're actually piloting now with LinkedIn using our own training uh, capabilities through LinkedIn Learning. Um, the ability to hire people in a sort of package which contains both uh, a job offer and a training program and an assessment. These non-traditional paths are going to be essential for filling work in the future. And I think are key to the flexibility that companies need to deploy as work changes. Thank you. So, you know, just before I move into the deputy uh, minister, one last quick question, one word maybe, of where should public investment and funding be deployed? Um, and, and Stephen, could, could you just come in on that and then we can uh, move into the next part? Oh, well, that's, a, that's a very good question. And we're right at that juncture about the jobs that we have in place. And so, for example, you won't be surprised well, that I'm <laughs> in many discussions about maintaining civil aviation and those spaces of those, those markets that we know will return. And we need conversation with government about the tripartite model. How do we make sure that government understands? And of course, we on our part understand that what we had nine months ago may not be what we have exactly now. But how do we get into that confidence, confidence conversation where we can ensure that employers know they can survive? And I think we need government to look at the, the, the new world in a different way because we have to bridge ourselves from this pandemic crisis, we have to build confidence. And I use civil aviation, there are many other, many other sectors, but it's about building co consumer travelers confidence that we will come through this. And coming through it means, it's not a one word answer, I apologize. It, we, we, we must come through it with confidence. And that's how do we do that in partnership and tripartitism, the International Labour Organization, those historical bodies that can help us deliver those kind of solutions. Nice answer, and I see the plane right behind you, so it's a very important sector, I hope it comes back fast. But you know, one of the key objectives of the summit is to have action-oriented outcomes. And I would like to invite the Deputy Minister, Kitia uh, Shibili, to share with us the plan that Georgia has in launching the Skills uh, Gap Accelerator. What are some of the key objectives that you'd like to achieve on this jobs and employment through this initiative, Deputy Minister? Thank you, Shabana. So, Shabana, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. 
Uh, we have, of course, uh, we are also challenged by pandemic situation in Georgia. Uh, Georgia is a growing economy, developing economy country, uh, has some particular challenges related to, um, to different sectors, including hospitality, as you have already mentioned. But we have some on, on the education and skills uh, uh, reform side. We have some lessons learned as well. And just to be very quick, I just wanted to, I was listening to uh, the co-panelists and uh, I, I was uh, really uh, convinced that uh, we are not alone in, uh, with these challenges in, in the entire world. First of all, we, we feel very, uh, very hardly that the flexibility and agility in education system it became very challenging and very problematic. Since uh, as far the development of economy goes, as uh, as quickly quicker and more agile we need to be, and uh, as challenging uh, this becomes, more challenging this becomes. So we need to we need to reshape shape our establishment and governance models to become more responsive and to, uh, to accelerate the processes of, of uh, skills gap closing. Uh, then on the other hand, we have, it, it became to us also very obvious that we have to increase the focus on key competencies of the students and labor force to be, uh, because the uh, adaptivity, uh, to, to become adaptive, to become flexible in terms of skills, became, as Alan as well mentioned, it's the most, one of the most uh, demanded skills today's in, on today's, uh, among today's labor force. So we need to make more emphasis on that and including entrepreneurial skills uh, to, to become, for, to give the floor and opportunity for the new generation to become more innovative, more, uh, more, uh, more startup and tech and innovation oriented. For that, the entrepreneurial thinking and key competences are very crucial. So we rescheduled our funding structures and our, uh, our efforts uh, to address uh, this challenge as well. Then uh, the third is the tech education. Uh, for Georgia, uh, despite the fact that hospitality sector struggles a lot, uh, there are some new opportunities open for Georgia. And this relates to digital and tech sector, definitely. So we, we catch the, this, uh, some opportunities and we try to open more for more and more investments in this sector uh, internally and from abroad. So we, we hope that uh, we, we can use this in a better way. And finally, we, um, and I just want to respond to what Stefan was uh, mentioning. Um, we found that uh, joining forces and cooperation is as important as it was never before in this situation. We saw that government, government alone cannot handle this problem related to skills, as well as the private sector cannot do it alone. The, I mean, the enterprises cannot do it alone. So we sat together and we found the way uh, how, to, uh, how, how, to, uh, how to really uh, accelerate the process. And we decided to create the new platform, which will be called Skills Georgia. This will be the uh, private public based uh, um, agency, the new agency which will take over in the private uh, sector setup. So this will be non-profit organization. It will take over the role of uh, skills policy, vocational education and training and skills uh, for youth and uh, adults policy implementation. So uh, starting from the qualification development and uh, mm -hmm. ending with the qualification awarding, everything will be um, uh, will be uh, done uh, through this agency and uh, a lot of em emphasis will be given to, uh, as I've already said, to entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, to technology education and work-based learning, all forms of work-based learning, 
including apprenticeships and short-term trainings for adults. Congratulations, Deputy Minister. I think it's a great effort and uh, love the word of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship and collaboration. I'd like to invite Lena Nair of Unilever uh, to announce a partnership with Walmart on reskilling workers. Thanks, Shobhana. Great to see you and delighted yeah. to be on the panel. Uh, I, you know, the time to act is now. There's never been a greater time than now to act. We know that millions of jobs are impacted and we know millions of jobs are created. And the thing that stands in between is how do we transition? How do we build a bridge from the jobs that exist today to the jobs that are going to exist tomorrow? And I'm really delighted to announce that Unilever, along with Walmart, are spearheading a pilot project to create the reskilling pathways that impacts more than 5,000 roles in the consumer industry today. So it's the first of its kind, non-competitive, totally collaborative partnership that we're doing along with Accenture and SkyHive. And I'm really keen that as many people as, uh, as is possible, companies, employers, workers, are part of this effort to create the reskilling pathways. You know, I really believe that skill and will has to be looked at together. You can create skill maps, but people have to be motivated to upskill themselves. And people who are scared, who are anxious, who are worried about livelihoods may not be in the best place to think about how they can reskill themselves. That's why employers have We've, uh, we've lost uh, Lena's video. Yeah, we lost Lena, but uh, you know, I can only say that uh, she generated so much um, energy during this uh, short talk and uh, both Unilever and Walmart are big in many of the countries you know, around the world. And, and they've actually been doing grassroots, creating millions and millions of jobs and lots of empowerment. So I think that wrapping this together at, you know, uh, to be closing and, and announcing this partnership, you know, is on this, um, this forum platform uh, is, is really, I think, uh, a highlight for all of us. And, and we're so proud and uh, I'm, I'm sure that we're going to see much of this really translate into actual jobs and the future of jobs that are going to get created so as we run out of time, I'd really like to hand over to Sadia, the moderator. And um, thank you so much, uh, Sadia, for putting it together and the co-chairs. Um, this has been a great learning for me. Shabana, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, moderating the discussion um, and managing to do that with the tech troubles um, uh, getting into the session. I think we're all living the future of jobs live. So um, thank you for, for managing that. Um, let me also thank um, all of the panelists. So thank you to Alan Blue, um, a longtime collaborator with the, the forum. Uh, thank you to Stephen Cotton. Thank you to Min Deputy Minister Kityashvili. Uh, thank you, Geraldine Matchett, also for co-chairing um, this session. And, and thanks to Lena in absentia for having brought forward this uh, important partnership. Um, I will simply recap five key outcomes from the day. I think we heard great things, some of which that you've heard on this panel. Um, the first is today we released our future of jobs report. Um, and that gives us a sense of what is coming up in the next five years. What does this double disruption mean for workers today, both from the pandemic recession and from technology? And what are the new opportunities that emerge? And again, thank you to LinkedIn and to others that contributed to many of the insights that are in that report. And I encourage you all to take a look at that. A second element is, um, Another uh, study that we released today, which was on resetting um, the future of work. And I think we all have been talking about the future of work for some time. And what we found is that that future of work that we were talking about some years ago has actually already arrived. And now there is a new, new future of work that is starting to emerge. And we're going to need new standards for it. Employers have a completely different type of responsibility in the next few years than the one that they did in the last few years. And what the study does is pull together the examples from some of the most responsible employers around the world, including many that are represented on this panel, um, and pulls together those examples as live case studies of what others need to emulate. 
A third element is what we heard from Lena, and I am delighted that that partnership has come together through the consumer industry. And the forum has nine other industry groups working on preparing workers for the future of work. And we hope that that will be an example that will be emulated by others working in a pre-competitive way to actually support the skilling and redeployment of workers across an industry. Fourth, um, you heard about Skills Georgia today. Thank you again very much, Deputy Minister. Um, you are now the 10th country that is taking forward a Closing the Skills and Jobs Gap Accelerator. We're delighted to be able to have this partnership with you and having this learning network between countries. Earlier today, we heard from the Minister from Brazil, Deputy Minister of Economy from Brazil, and they have already, in just the last few months alone, put in place a program that has reskilled already 8 million people across the country. So again, this is the moment to invest. And finally, I wanted to mention, there were so many great ideas heard today, but the one that I think we will all have to ensure we take forward um, as we look to the next months is the idea of a global social protection fund, because we do need to support everybody who has to move through this transition, formal workers, informal workers, and anyone who will need income support as they reskill and upskill themselves towards the new future of jobs. So thank you again to all of the panelists and thank you to all of you who joined us online. And we look forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow focused more specifically on education, skills, and learning. Thank you again.